Okay, I have us at 1.30, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So thank you everybody and welcome to North Dakota Brain Injury Network's uh, webinar Wednesdays. Um, and so today we are talking about metacognition, lack of insight and impaired self-awareness. This is a continuation of the cognitive effects presentation that we had two weeks ago. Um, and so this is just a more in-depth look at metacognition, which is the highest level of cognitive processes that we kind of left off with uh, two weeks ago. So if you didn't get a chance to see that one, feel free to go back and watch it. It is archived on the website. Um, and we will be archiving this one on the website as well, with, along with the PowerPoints and um, the, a link to get continuing education units if you'd like. Um, and then we have some other webinar Wednesdays uh, coming up uh, in two weeks. We have uh, Dr. Schmo um, from Minnesota that is going to be presenting. And then in a month, uh, we will have um, on brain injury in the criminal justice system. So, and that's actually gonna be a panel with an addiction counselor, a um, probation and parole officer, and an individual. So we'll be having that in a month. So thank you everybody. Um, feel free, uh, I'm gonna get started. Feel free if you do have a question, you can raise your hand through the Zoom functionality of raising your hand or put something in the chat box. Um, and Carly, who is on uh, with the Brain Injury Network, and many of you know, she's waving. She'll be tracking on all of that for us. And um, we'll have all of that information. So I'll try to answer what questions I have. So we are going to move forward. So as I said, metacognition, um, for those of you that have had a chance to either uh, watch the presentation from two weeks ago or watch the archived. Um, we went through this cognitive wheel on the screen that starts with attention at blue and then goes through categorization, memory processing, executive function. And those are kind of the stair steps of cognitive processes that build on each other that can be impacted by brain injury. So, but then the final cognitive process, kind of a higher order, the highest level cognitive process is called metacognition. And that's really uh, self-awareness. It's the regulatory function that allows you to kind of think about your thinking, um, to do that self-reflection, uh, look back and be able to, from that, other perspective look at where you're at. And this is a common um, deficit after brain injury. Um, and so important to talk about it. Um, one of the things, however, is particularly deficits in uh, metacognition and self-awareness are not unique to brain injury. So as you can see from this cartoon, you know, this individual is annoyed. You know, why don't people bother to stop their watch beeping? It's so annoying yet it's his watch beeping and he is not aware. Um, other times, you know, other examples, um, somebody driving uh, too slow in the fast lane. Um, you know, when you go by that person and you pass them on the right and you're really annoyed and you're like, why are they not moving over? That's a self-awareness function for that individual to be aware that, hey, I'm the one that's causing problems here. Maybe I should move over. So it's definitely not unique to brain injury, um, but it is common with brain injury. Um, so a fancy word time. Um, so anosognosia is, um, it's the fancy word for problems with self-awareness uh, insight after brain injury. Um, and so it's defined as the inability to recognize deficits or problems um, caused by neurological injury. Uh, so as a word, you know, the, the A stands for without, NOSO stands for disease, and NOSIA stands for knowledge. So really that's what the word means is without having knowledge of, of the disease. Um, and so really, it, but it, it's reserved for that neurological injury 
and that inability to be doing that recognition of deficits. So that's the fancy word. Sometimes you hear it used. Usually what you'll hear is more uh, impaired insight or impaired self-awareness or lack of insight. That, that's usually the terminology that you might hear. So, but I figured I'd throw out the fancy word in case you do hear that word. Um, so one of the things is that it definitely is said that this is one of the most, if not the most critical issues uh, after brain injury. Um, awareness deficits are not well understood. Um, they are difficult to treat and they arguably, they are some of the most critical issues affecting outcomes. Um, and the process, unfortunately, for improving insight and awareness is slow and laborious. So it's kind of chipping away at a mountain. Um, and for some individuals, there may be deficits there that are unable to be regained. So impact of impaired self-awareness. Um, one of the reasons why we say that it's, you know, the most critical issue uh, after brain injury is because really in brain injury, it's the only time you have an injured body part that's expected to do that self-awareness. And it's expected to, uh, you know, be able to monitor itself. So anytime we injure any other body parts, our brain is the one that, you know, monitors that, lets us know, you know, how much our back's hurting, whether or not we can continue, you know, doing an activity, those type of things. But in a brain injury, it's the brain that is doing that monitoring of where it's at. And it doesn't always do the best job. Um, one of the things is that if an individual has impaired self-awareness, um, they may not appreciate the impact of their impairments. Um, you know, the impact these impairments are gonna have on their plan for living in community, for returning to work or school, for driving, um, they may not understand the purpose of any provided services. So a lot of times individuals may say, oh no, I don't need any therapies, uh, I'm doing fine. Um, when actually, yes, they maybe would benefit. Um, understand the purpose of any type of task or goals, um, particularly if they're, they're short-term goals and they really can't see the purpose of developing those because they just focus on getting the larger um, goal. Um, or even the purpose of participation in community activities, uh, engagement with others, they, they just don't understand or appreciate the importance of that. Uh, and so one of the things is that it can then lead to poor motivation, lack of cooperation, argumentativeness, irritability, um, denying you know, services. So saying, no, I don't need services when really they do. Um, you know, disagreements between providers and family members about what they see their functionality as, you know, thinking that family members are kind of trying to control them when family members see it as just an, a needed, you know, support. So it, you know, having that impaired self-awareness is then such a trickle-down effect of it fe affecting all other skill sets. So um, one of the important things to kind of talk about is uh, in the impaired self-awareness after a brain injury is neurologically based. It's different than being in denial or avoidance. Um, th there are issues related to denial and avoidance after brain injury, um, but those are different than having a neurological inability to kind of do that self-reflection. So it, it's kind of that inability to see by the brain to process the information. Um, and so I think that's important because a lot of times people see it as this individual is just making the choice to re refuse to accept the circumstance or they're making the choice to um, just avoid it because they don't wanna deal with their deficits. Whereas th this is different and it, it's more that neurological base. And so important to understand that when you are dealing with somebody that's impaired self-awareness is that th they don't, they may not have the capacity to see it from the perspective you're seeing it and to see their deficits from that perspective. 
So um, one of the things is that it is uh, variable and inconsistent. Um, so, you know, impaired self-awareness, deficits in self-awareness can range from mild to severe. So somebody can just have a little bit of mild uh, and not, you know, not quite think that their memory impairment is as bad as it is, or not quite understand how quickly their temper, um, they might lose their temper. Too very severe where somebody is in complete lack of awareness of any of their deficits, they, they don't see any problems, you know, this being somebody that, you know, thinks that they're going to be able to go play pro, you know, pro baseball next year when they're, you know, a 45-year-old overweight male that probably is never going to play pro baseball. But they have that true uh, belief because they are unable to see their deficits and impacting. Um, the severity can differ across domains. So uh, it may be that somebody is very accepting of their physical deficits and have no problem understanding that they, you know, have trouble walking long distances or they can no longer drive, but is not aware of their memory deficits. So, so it is variable across those domains. Um, and then generally across those variabilities, generally there is a greater impaired self-awareness for cognitive and behavioral deficits than physical impairments. Um, that just being because physical impairments are ones that usually are pretty um, upfront and obvious. They make themselves pretty known to somebody right away. Uh, and it's less easy for somebody to, to kind of ignore them or, or think around them. So, you know, if somebody has uh, trouble walking distances, that's something that if they set out on it, it becomes pretty apparent for them and they're able to see that. So that's part of why there's that uh, greater for cognitive and behavioral than physical impairments. Um, physical impairments are also easier for us to have an understanding of. Um, most of us know what walking is. We know what muscle weakness is. We know those type of physical, but a lot of individuals don't really have a full grasp understanding of like cognitive deficits or behavioral deficits to really be able to even just understanding like what are cognitive skills to be able to say I have impairments in that. So, so it's just kind of an easier to grasp the physical. Um, so uh, impaired self-awareness, um, it is affected by psychological factors, uh, particularly an individual's emotional state, um, their pre-injury uh, personality, um, you know, is this somebody that has a high level of defensiveness, um, do they have openness, um, su suspiciousness, a need to be in control, so all of those type of things can be a factor uh, involved in it. Um, and it's affected by the environment, you know, what, what situation and setting the person is in. Um, if the individual maybe is in a group living setting, then they might have a higher level of suspiciousness and have limited impaired self-awareness that it, things are maybe related to their deficits. But if they're living with, you know, family or alone, they might be more willing to accept it because they don't have those others to be suspicious of. So there's definitely those psychological factors and the environment that affects it. Um, family support and structure. Um, does somebody have a involved family that, you know, is, is aware and able to give them feedback regularly and able for them to interact with about these things? then that may, you know, limit their impaired self-awareness. But if somebody has maybe a negative family structure or lives alone, they may not have that support system and may have an increased impaired self-awareness. So predictors of the degree of impaired self-awareness, um, and these are all generalizations, but have statistically significant, you know, as predictors. Um, one is the injury severity. Uh, generally, the more severe an injury, the higher level of impaired self-awareness you're going to have. Um, age, so this one is kind of a flip. Usually the younger age that an individual is, 
the worse impaired self-awareness they're going to have. Um, and that, that related to them having less of that opportunity of pre-development before their brain injury and having an understanding of how things have changed, whereas instead they're just growing up and see themselves aligned with everybody else and don't have a way of knowing what's different. Um, emotional distress, so um, actually less emotional distress is associated with greater um, impaired self-awareness. Um, one of the things I think with that is that individuals that have greater impaired self-awareness actually are less emotionally distressed. Um, they don't see their deficits. So they see that everything is great and they don't have that level of emotional distress about what they've lost and maybe what their deficits are because everything's just hunky-dory. Um, Pre-injury psychological defense mechanisms. Um, the more defensive somebody is before, even before injury, um, if somebody was a, you know, kind of defensive and suspicious person before, then that's going to have a higher level of impaired self-awareness. Again, the environment, we had talked about that. Um, and then other cognitive deficits. Um, so as I said at the beginning of the presentation, this is, we were talking about how all of the cognitive skills kind of grow, grow and build on each other, starting with attention. And so deficits in other cognitive areas can have an impact on impaired self-awareness. And generally, individuals that have higher cognitive deficits are going to also have higher impaired self-awareness. Um, so this is kind of talking about some of those uh, other cognitive skills. Um, so impaired reasoning. So if an individual has impaired reasoning skills or processing, then they may not always understand the effects of their actions. Um, that processing and reasoning is that ability to, uh, you know, make connections between things, do that decision making. And if somebody has impairments in that, then they may not be able to understand the effects of their actions to, to process and reason uh, what that is. Um, and unable to make those connections between their impairment and the consequence. So they just don't have the, the skills to make that connection and connect those dots. Uh, for individuals that have attention and concentration problems, um, this may cause an individual to not observe their mistakes. Uh, they may not be able to see that they didn't you know, perform something um, because they had problems with attention and concentration. Um, I had a client once that had some pretty significant self-awareness issues, um, but one of the things in doing some observation with him was I found that he had very, very limited uh, attention and concentration. And so he would start a task, but then he would stop and kind of go off and do something else. Well, what was happening was his mother would come along and finish it. So a specific example of laundry, let's say. He would start the laundry by taking the wash downstairs and maybe even starting a load in the washer, but then he would forget about it. And his mother would then, you know, take the wash from the washing machine, put it in the dryer, put it in the basket, fold the laundry, and put it up in his room. So when I asked him, you know, about his ability to do laundry, he was like, yeah, I have clothes, don't I? But because he had deficits in attention, he was never staying on task long enough to really see that it wasn't him that was completing it. He, you know, he had that problem with attention and memory to where he was like, yeah, got done. Um, and so then part of the intervention there was really working with mom on her needing to allow him to fail. You know, and she said, but if he leaves the laundry in the wash and it, you know, it gets moldy and musty, I said, well, then that's, you know, then needing to work on his attention of setting up a cueing mechanism and setting up some checklists and some alarms. So putting in place those, those compensations so that but he needs to be able to see that it's not happening. Because when I talked to him about needing to address his, you know, laundry not getting done, he refused to even have a conversation with me because he's like, but I, my laundry does get done. I do it. And so I needed to get mom to stop 
so that he could see the failure. Um, attention and concentration also means difficult noticing changes as they're happening. Somebody may just be going through the actions, but they're not concentrating enough to pick up on that subtle what's actually happening. Um, impaired memory, um, you know, for sometimes for impaired memory, um, people may see themselves as before their injury, uh, particularly in significant uh, injuries and memory impairments. People don't have that memory of having the injury and that memory of their deficits and where things are at. So they really see that they're able to return to work that they had before and why am I not still doing my job and I can do that and these people are preventing me. Um, or for lesser impaired memory may just have difficulty retaining and retrieving information about their performance. Um, so like example of the gentleman with the laundry, he wasn't able to recall that no, he had walked away and hadn't done the laundry. So his mind just filled in the gaps by assuming that he had done it. Um, so that, that was part of his memory impairment that he was unable to recall that to say, oh, I didn't do it. You're right. Um, emotional acceptance is another cognitive, um, particularly damage to the frontal lobe, um, really difficult to process and, it's, and accept those effects. Um, that being related to that part of where that uh, metacognition and that piece of really doing that self-reflection and damage to that prevents that as that self-reflection piece. So what does impaired self-awareness look like? Um, often individuals with impaired self-awareness under, underestimate uh, their problems, or they may not be aware that problems are, are exist. So they may be, say something like, um, my friends are lying. Um, you're just exaggerating about that. So, you know, you're just exaggerating about the number of times I've missed appointments this last month because they're underestimating or they're not aware, they don't see it as a part of, you know, that, that's actually happening. Um, blaming others for their problems. Um, this is very common um, that I like to call this kind of a justified um, paranoia where people, you know, they'll say, well, I, I tried to work with, you know, my job coach, but they refused to help me rather than recognizing that their deficits um, you know, prevented them from showing up for appointments or their deficits you know, caused them to get frustrated and you know, refu refuse to you know, complete tasks. So they don't see that as them refusing to complete tasks. They see that as you know, the job coach just didn't understand. Um, not using compensatory tools, uh, so back to my example of the gentleman doing his laundry, um, he, whenever I talked about some mechanism to help with laundry, he didn't need that. Everything was fine. Um, so, you know, I don't need to set my alarm to take my meds. I'll remember. Um, I don't need to write down appointments. I have a good memory. Um, wanting to change, but not following through. Um, so saying, you know, I'm going to be on time to my next appointment. Or, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to get angry and frustrated next time I, you know, go to my therapist. So they want to change, but then when it happens, they, they don't have the skills to make it happen. And so then they're really frustrated because they don't have an understanding of why they can't follow through because they really don't understand the full impact of their deficits. Um, so often, you know, set unrealistic goals, you know, my example of the guy that wants to play baseball, but that obviously is a really, really unrealistic goal, but um, people that, you know, feel that they would go, be able to go back to work, um, people that I often have individuals that will, you know, not take lower paying jobs because they think that they should be able to get a higher paying job, but don't realize that how much their deficits are, have changed and that they may not be at a level that they can sustain that higher paying job. 
So setting those unrealistic goals, um, you know, the unrealistic goal of that, you know, you're, you're going to be able to build a deck this summer. Well, if, if, you know, that's not within your skill set, being able to do that back and look. Um, is unable to identify or alter inappropriate behaviors. Um, you know, somebody that is maybe ki kicked out of a treatment group or has a provider that will no longer work with them, they don't know why. You know, I don't know why that, that counselor won't work with me anymore. They're, you know, they're just, you know, being mean or they just don't like me. But if asking, you know, well, is there anything that you did? Nope, they, they just don't have that ability to see their, their behaviors or to even alter them. Um, and so it can be that, again, that scale and that variability. It may be that somebody's unable to identify. It may be that they're able and they say, yeah, you know, I got kicked out of group for making inappropriate comments about, you know, the female members, but I, I don't know why I did it. I wish I didn't do it, you know, and I promise I won't do it again, but then they do do it again. Uh, may say things that other people might be thinking, but would not say aloud. So they have that, you know, a lot of what we use our awareness for, our self-awareness, is our social filter. You know, our social filter allows us to kind of know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and to gauge what we're thinking of, how does this fit within society and the so social norms? Well, if somebody has impairments in self-awareness, they may not be able to do that. Um, they may dominate interactions with others. <laughs> So not able to do that self-awareness reflection of saying, wow, I'm talking a lot and I haven't you know, heard them say anything and I keep interrupting about my story or my whatever and I'm not giving an opportunity for everybody to share. So they may dominate that interaction, um, interrupt conversations, um, not able to do that you know, self-reflection regarding if two people are already talking and to see that it would be, you know, inappropriate to interrupt them, um, you know, so not able to do that. So one of the things is part of this, so we've talked kind of about what self-awareness looks like. And so now we're gonna start talking about it as a, you know, kind of definitions and from a, you know, hierarchical model approach to kind of get a better understanding of what's happening and what's going on. So th this approach is um, a, a hierarchical approach. As I said, um, it's a model that's been around for quite a while, I think from the late 70s, um, but it's been well used, long time. Um, and it's this idea that there's a hierarchy of awareness, acceptance, and adjustment. And it starts out with awareness. And awareness is having an objective knowledge of existence of your own deficits. So being able to have a kind of objective knowledge that you can say, yes, I have problems with interrupting people. Um, and so that's that, that first step. And then that second step is really coming to an acceptance, understanding the significance of those deficits. So being able to say, I have problems interrupting people. And as a result, a lot of my friends don't really like being around me anymore. And then the third step is adjustment. And adjustment is actually making changes to your behavior in response. So being able to really actually change things. So, you know, it might say, you know, I have problems interrupting people. As a result, my friends don't really like hanging out with me anymore. So I've started a system where I'm only gonna allow myself to, you know, talk three times for every time, you know, somebody else speaks. Or I'm only going to allow myself to you know, share two pieces of information in the conversation. So you know, setting up um, for some people, you know, they actually have things that they carry, like a token, and 
you know, in that example, they have the token in their hand and they maybe move the token from one hand to the other when they share and then they, they can't move it back until the other person has time to talk. And, you know, so the ways of building that, but they're making changes in their behavior in response to the, the awareness and the acceptance. So here's a nifty chart that shows this, and we're going to kind of go through some of these. We're particularly going to be talking about the awareness one, which is the triangle on the left. Um, and so these are the different steps through awareness that it goes through. Um, it is a hierarchy. So we're going to talk about those awareness steps. And then you can see they're interrelated with the acceptance. So somebody that is at a low level of awareness, which is the intellectual, they have no acceptance at that place. So they are not at a place that they are able to even identify their deficits. So they cannot identify the impact of those deficits. But when somebody moves up a little higher and they're an emergent, then they're able and their acceptance gets a little bit better. And same as they, they move up. One of the things with adjustment and accommodation is individuals can't reach that adjustment accommodation stage until they've moved through these levels of awareness and acceptance. Um, so ideally, you would want somebody to be at that place where they automatically are adjusting their behavior or using any type of accommodation compensation strategy because they have that awareness and acceptance. Um, one of the reasons why I spend a lot of time talking about this, and I think it's really important, is I often see uh, any providers working with people, family, anybody that starts at adjustment accommodation. They really feel that if you just provide a compensation strategy, you just provide an accommodation, then everything's going to be solved. But they don't understand that for that individual, in order for them to truly adopt that accommodation or that compensation strategy, they have to have an awareness and acceptance. So a really, it, it's that important piece of how do you really help with that person having that awareness and acceptance so they can then adopt any accommodation or you know, adjustment strategies. So in talking about this, as I said, we're going to spend some time talking about levels of awareness and what the levels of awareness are. Um, awareness starts at the bottom with intellectual awareness. Um, intellectual awareness is somebody that may be aware that a problem has occurred, but is unable to identify it. So they may say, I missed my doctor's appointment but they're unable to say that it's because they have problems with memory um, or unable to say it's because they have problems with time management. And so they were in, you know, got in the shower 10 minutes before their doctor's appointment was set to begin. So they're unable to really identify what the problem is. And then uh, moving up in kind of the level of uh, self-awareness, um, the next is emergent. Um, emergent is when an individual can recognize when an impairment affects their ability as it occurs. So maybe when they miss their doctor's appointment, they're able to say, oh my gosh, I had a doctor's appointment right now. I can't believe I missed it. Whereas below in the intellectual, that maybe is more when the doctor's office called them to reschedule. They're like, oh shoot, I had a doctor's appointment this morning. So, so, so it's, are they able to recognize it as it's happening? And then the next and the last highest level is anticipatory. Um, so for an anticipatory um, awareness, an individual is able to anticipate the impairment and how it will affect things. So they may be able to say, you know, I have problems with time management, so, I miss doctor's appointments, or I, you know, have trouble getting out of the house in the morning. Now, at this level, they're still not doing anything about it. They're still not affecting their behavior because that's over in the acceptance and the accommodation. But they at least now can identify it and accept and, and recognize how it's going to affect things. So back to that base level intellectual. 
Um, you know, this is really that kind of trouble with understanding at the lowest level. Um, you know, somebody might say, I couldn't think of anything to say in my, you know, in the club with my friends. My mind was just blank. I don't know why my mind was blank. I don't know. You know, they're not able to say I have problems following conversation. They just kind of have this as it's a problem. Um, individuals at this level are likely to have challenges with abstract reasoning and memory. Um, they're not able to usually generalize knowledge from one situation to another. So they're not able to see deficits that they have or problems they have in one area and how they would impact them in another because they're not able to have that abstract reasoning and memory recall to carry things forward. Um, now, emergent awareness, um, somebody at emergent awareness, remember this is where they are able to recognize the problem while it's actually happening. Um, so this is somebody that may get perplexed, they may get angry, you know, as I said, mad at themselves when they they miss their doctor's appointment. Um, this might be something that's trying to complete a task and they, they say, oh my gosh, I'm messing this up. I can't believe, you know, I, I completely messed up this, you know, this recipe and I, my concentration's just gone. Um, so they, they really, you know, they're able to see it while it's happening, but don't, don't have that awareness to see, okay, but this deficit is going to impact things in the future. Um, they really have trouble monitoring the connection between the actions and the environment. So have difficulty seeing how their actions affect things like following the recipe. Um, they, they can see that the recipe is being messed up while they're doing it, but they're really not able to see like, okay, what skill sets am I missing here? And how are my actions affecting this recipe getting messed up? Deficits at this level are the most frustrating for caregivers and providers. Um, at the, you know, the intellectual level before, uh, a lot of individuals at that level are kind of blissfully unaware. Um, and a lot of times uh, providers and family members can, can kind of control things. And that individual living in that blissful unawareness, it, it allows for them to just not be aware enough of, of what others are doing for them. So, so they're kind of, you know, okay with things. Whereas at this emergent level, individuals are right there. They're right at the cusp of being able to see their deficits enough to recognize that they're impacting them, recognize enough how much things are messed up and changed from what they were before or what they want, but not enough to do anything about it. Um, it also means that at this level, really at a, you know, not wanting others to help them, being aware enough that, no, I want to do this myself. I don't need your help. Whereas somebody at that intellectual level, they're so unaware that they don't mind help because they are just unaware that they're not doing it. Whereas this is the level that really starts to be aware of what others are doing for them or helping them with and that frustration builds and that creates a lot of tension between either providers, family members, you know, counselors, those pieces. So the final level of awareness um, is anticipatory awareness. So anticipatory, exactly what it sounds like, you can anticipate. So for somebody at this level of awareness, they're able to realize in advance that a particular deficit might cause a problem in the future. So they're able to say, I have problems with time management in the morning and it affects me getting out of the house in time. You know, they're able to say that it affects me getting out of the house in time. Now they still haven't made any changes, but they can just say it. So this might be somebody that just kind of does a shrug their shoulders and like, okay, you know, I had problems with time management in the morning, so it's really hard for me to make appointments. So don't bother scheduling anything before one. You know, they haven't really done that level of how can I possibly change this? How can I, you know, intervene? But they're able to anticipate it and work around it. Um, this is where they can predict um, that a learned compensation strategy 
could help avoid a problem. So they might say, hold on, let me grab my pen and paper before you start. So they're able to kind of predict and start to see those pieces, but really still are having problems with it, like being second nature and really having adapted and adopting accommodations. Rebecca, we got a good question here. Um, Nikki asked, is it possible for someone to be in more than one level depending on the task or situation or emotional state? Absolutely. So, um, and that's related to, you know, from the beginning I said there's a lot of variability here. Um, one variability with, within how much an individual, you know, their emotional state. If somebody's really flustered and overwhelmed, they may not be able to be processing what's going on and have a much lower awareness of what their role was because they're flustered, they're overwhelmed, um, maybe they're angry about it. So their, their perception might be changed and that might bump them down. Um, similarly, across domains. So again, somebody may have no problem with their you know emotional uh awareness and acceptance and understand that they have a low frustration tolerance they're easy to anger and those pieces and have really adopted a lot of accommodations and are really on key with that but they're completely unaware of their maybe cognitive effects like memory and task completion um, so, so it, it is possible to cross different like skill sets and domains like that and based on their, you know, uh, emotional state and those pieces. Does that make sense? Yes, she says, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, so, oh, previous. Um, so just as a recap, and I feel like I'm going to, uh, through it again and again, but <laughs> so intellectual awareness, again, basic knowledge of deficits, but unable to see how they cause problems. Emergent, they have knowledge of deficits and able to see the problem as it's happening, but unable to make future changes or to see how it's going to impact things in the future. Um, anticipatory awareness, they have knowledge of their deficits, they're able to anticipate problems, and they're beginning to alter their behavior. Um, so they're really, they're able to anticipate those problems coming about in the future. So particularly with emergent and anticipatory awareness, um, but I also think across all of these awarenesses, you know, levels, you must observe uh, you, you know, awareness deficits can only be assessed through observation of the behavior or some comparison discrepancy. Um, because there really is that discrepancy between what individuals say and what they actually do. Um, there, you know, this being related to that, this being a neurological impairment and how the brain processes information. Um, and the brain being unable to. And one of the things that we know about brain injury as well is brain, your brain will fill in gaps. And it will fill in gaps with what most likely makes sense. So for an individual, you might ask, like the guy that I ask, you know, so how is doing your laundry? To him, it's completely fine. Everything's great, hunky-dory. Um, if I was a provider that maybe was, let's say, doing like, you know, an ADL and IADL assessment on his, you know, independent living skills, and I were to just ask him, hey, you know, are you able to do laundry? And he says, yep, no problem, do it okay. Checkbox, everything's great. Um, the individual that I'm actually thinking of, that was a real uh, individual that I worked with quite a while ago, um, and he was one that actually had completely returned to work. And so he was even working um, 30 plus hours a week, but was still as a, you know, early 30s living with mom, mom was still doing all of his independent living self cares. I mean, like he was self bathing and things, but most of his IADLs is, you know, though, those mom was doing them all. She was cooking for him. She's cleaning for him. She's doing laundry. And mom said, you know, when is this all going to change? 
And it, part of it was is that he, there was such a discrepancy between what he said he could do and what he could actually do. Um, and the reason why I bring it up, particularly here as far as this must observe, is uh, we actually tried to refer him for some uh, services. And the first time we did that, the screener that went in that screened whether or not he was capable and needed services asked him as a functioning competent adult if he was able to do these things or not. And he said yes. And the you know provider doing the assessment went away and said, I, he doesn't need any services, everything's great. And so really it's not enough to ask what a person would do in a given situation. It's not enough to ask them how they perform. You need to actually either have observation um, of the person in the situation yourself or have some way of capturing that from other individuals. So assessment of impaired self-awareness. Um, like I said, observation scale and scales are the two biggest ways. Uh, for observation, really looking for discrepancy between report and action. You know, if you are asking an individual, you know, how they perform something and they tell you, then having them actually perform it and be able to see. Um, and then as part of that observation as well, looking for any other impaired cognition that may be impacting things, just as part of helping complete that um, assessment of self-awareness. You know, what are the other areas as far as like memory and concentration and attention that may be impacting their self-awareness that could be addressed to help increase the self-awareness. Um, there are, we're gonna kind of talk about three different commonly used awareness scales. Um, these are, there's the awareness questionnaire, um, a patient competent, competency rating scale, and then the procedure for assessing awareness and adjustment following brain injury. Um, the awareness questionnaire, um, this is a 17 item, um, you know, rated on five point scale, ranging from worse to better. One of the things about the awareness questionnaire is it focuses on comparing the individual to now versus before their injury. So it was predominantly developed for use for like inpatient and some like uh, structured outpatient therapies. Um, so it really is looking at like, how are they now versus that compared to before the injury? Um, very much in that sense kind of follows that medical model of like a recovery, you know, getting them back to that pre-injury state. Um, it's administered to the, the patient, to the individual, and their family significant other for comparison, and then that comparison is provided. Um, this is a scale that is uh, free. Uh, it's easy to print, to utilize. It's welcome to anybody to utilize it. There's no proprietary thing. It is free on the Combi website. Um, that is the Combi website there. For those of you that don't know, um, Combi is the... Uh, Center for Outcome Measurement After Brain Injury, and they keep track of all of these brain injury scales. But I will also say we also have copies of it at NDBIN, so feel free if you're interested to shoot us an email, and we can provide you all the information, the PDF, everything uh, for you um, if you want. So the next one is the Patient Competency Rating Scale. Um, this is 30 items, also rated on a five-point scale. Uh, one of the things is different is this is not a comparison. So this just rates the individual's current abilities. So there's no pre-morbid functioning, pre-injury functioning. Um, and it does have actually three different versions. So it is a version that goes to the individual, a version that goes to the family significant other, and then a version that goes to any type of clinician working with them. And then it compares across the three. Um, you are able to, you know, pick and choose that. So you could do just the, you know, the individual one. And if you're a provider, you know, the provider one, you could do just the family and the individual. So it is able to do that. Um, again, this one is free. Um, it's able to be printed and utilized. It is free on the Combi website, but we also do have it at NBBIN. If anybody's interested, welcome to email us. Uh, we can provide that for you. 
Uh, the next one is the procedure for assessing awareness and adjustment following brain injury. Um, this is a book uh, published by Lash and Associates uh, Publishing. Um, Lash and Associates is a brain injury publishing house that publishes lots of different materials around brain injury. Um, they have a great website. Um, Marilyn Lash, for those of anybody who's been around this long, uh, Marilyn Lash, we did have maybe seven, eight years ago, come and speak in Fargo. Um, she was the founder of it um, based on, she was a social worker and then her brother had a brain injury. So she wanted to develop brain injury materials. Um, but so this procedure for assessing awareness and adjustment, um, it is a stepwise approach. Um, it has 24 guided steps and worksheets. Um, it uh, is really um, designed for just anybody to use it. It really is a, you know, has that procedure for assessment, assessing where an individual is at and then guide you through like interventions to really work with that individual. Um, so we have copies of it at MD Bin. Welcome to request it from us. We're happy to provide that or any information out of it. Um, I will say the um, graphics with like the triangle regarding awareness and adjustment, all of that information does come from this book. So it does have quite a bit of good information in it. Um, so that then brings us to treatment approaches. So starting out with a warning of it is not an easy task. Um, you know, definitely not a uh, easy task as to how to approach impaired self-awareness, what possibly, you know, treatment approaches are. Um, but saying that, <laughs> after that warning, um, the biggest piece is establishing a good working relationship, um, particularly if you're a provider working with an individual. Um, if they trust you and like you, they are more likely to believe you. Um, if they don't trust you, they don't like you, they're skeptical, they're really not going to believe what you have to say about their awareness. Um, multiple interventions will be necessary. Um, there's not going to be one, you know, magic bullet, one simple answer. There's no magic wand. Um, and really having to use multiple approaches simultaneously. Really needing this to be something where an individual is getting multiple approaches all at the same time. They're kind of pointing the same direction. And as part of that, a team approach is really critical. So if this is something that, you know, is being worked on, then either a counselor or a provider working with somebody, you know, as much as you can engage family, friends, others in the process and really have, like I said, multiple different people pointing the same direction, the better. Um, <clears throat> it is okay uh, to begin with just having them pair it back their deficit. Um, don't, you know, feel like, well, yes, they can say they have memory impairments, but it's just them saying it because I've told them to say it. They don't really believe it. Well, that's the first step. Um, you know, they, it's the beginning of the process. And as much as you can get them to kind of pair that back, that's fine. Um, also any type of giving concrete feedback. Um, about improved awareness and really providing that concrete positive support is good. Um, you know, saying last week you wouldn't have been aware of that problem. Um, you know, it shows progress that, you know, you this week were even able to identify it. Um, you know, particularly it might be somebody comes in and they say, you know, I missed my doctor's appointment and wasn't even aware until after they called. You know, but that's good because before you, you know, even after they called, you still would have said that you didn't, you know, miss it. It wasn't your fault. They, you know, messed up the scheduling. So you at least now are saying, yes, you know, you had a role in it. So, but providing that concrete feedback. 
Um, a few things about intellectual awareness. Remember that is that very bottom. Um, it is the hardest to train and to work with. Uh, usually individuals at that level have significant deficits in memory. Um, and that is a significant barrier. Um, individuals that are at that intellectual awareness may always require external cues. Uh, they may always kind of need that. Um, and it going hand in hand with the severity of their injury and their significant defi you know, deficits, their inability to really see that the impact of them. Um, as far as this, using concrete language, always very direct and upfront approach. Um, and then any type of huge external compensation strategies. So compensation strategies that don't require them to really be the, the leader of and the implementer of. So things like social stories for completing tasks, um, alarms, having a written out daily schedule that's provided to them, um, a high rate of repetitions um, for this. You know, individuals that require a high rate of repetition to really grasp the task and to be able to, to, to really start to even gain, you know, some, some awareness. Part of this, avoiding arguments. Um, try to avoid directly confronting individuals or challenging their ideas about their capacity. Um, this can lead to conflict, disagreement. Um, it's not worth the argument. Um, needing to find other more gradual ways um, to introduce the person and to give them time to think about it are better than having that confrontational argument. So, you know, if you bring up, you know, a problem with their memory and they seem to be getting upset about it or disagree with you, then it's kind of worth like skirting around that and more talking in general terms and give them time to think. Because the, the argument and when they're at that argument and disagreeing point, they're just going to dig their heels in further and you're not going to be successful on getting them, you know, it's just going to become this um, me versus them. Uh, education is a big key. Um, one, starting out with helping individuals to recognize that decreased insight is a symptom of brain injury. Uh, understanding that, you know, that that is normal. It is normal and to be expected after a brain injury for individuals to have decreased insight. You know, even starting that conversation of, you know, that I kind of started off by saying brain injury is the only time that we expect the injured body part to do an assessment on itself. You know, when you break your leg, it's your, your brain that tells you. But in a brain injury, it's the brain, it's still the brain, and it doesn't always do a good job. So just helping, you know, normalize and helping kind of normalize that even that idea of decreased insight, our limited self-awareness, our components of this. That kind of plants that seed to help them start to understand that their difference in perception they have may be normal and part of this process. Um, this is, you know, this piece applies to across everything after brain injury, not just impaired self-awareness, but really focus on one or two most serious deficits. What are the two, one or two areas that their awareness is most impacting them? You know, is, is it a lack of awareness of, you know, a, a follow through on, you know, appointments? Is, is it their, you know, their inability to be aware of social cues um, that is really causing them to actually get in trouble some with, you know, family members, providers, and those things? So really picking out what are one or two of the most serious areas that they are having, uh, you know, impaired self-awareness and, and, and write them down in simple language, give them a copy, review them frequently, consistently, really kind of as part of that conversation and initiating that, really just focusing on those one or two things. Um, engaging any um, family, uh, and providing education for them to reinforce the concepts. Um, you know, after all, why should they believe you? Uh, but if their families are there, then the families, um, you know, they really need to be those important allies. 
uh, and treating the awareness of and deficits. Because if the families are not on board, then it can create that triangulation where the individual says, oh, no, no, my, you know, my girlfriend said that I don't have these problems and you're just caught, you know, you're just making things worse for me. So as much as you can have that engagement from family and friends to kind of help reinforce. Um, plan and practice, um, plan ahead for situations, talk about potential obstacles, you know, try to start planning ahead for, you know, you have problems getting out of the house in the morning. What, what are some ways that, you know, we could maybe, you know, work on that? Um, so developing a plan, even if it's something that the individual isn't 100% on board with, but they're willing to talk about that and plan, you're, you're still planting that seed and really getting them to start thinking about it. Um, practice, you know, practice positive social interactions, um, practice using and accepting cues for compensation. So this might be something where if an individual gets frustrated, they're in that emergent awareness and they're frustrated and saying, you know, I've messed up this recipe. I don't know why I did it. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure how this happened. You know, it might be saying, you know, would you like some help? Uh, you know, or if they're relaying that something like that happened after could say, you know, that sounds like that would have been a good time that you could have maybe asked for some help or you could have, you know, gone and looked back up the recipe and used it as a checklist to see what step you missed. So help practicing and accepting and kind of planting the seeds of those compensation strategies. Um, providing feedback. So provide frequent non-critical feedback. So not being critical of, I can't believe you missed your appointment again, but providing that frequent feedback of, you, know, you, 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 know, you missed another appointment and you know, we're having to reschedule. You know, was there something this time that you know, was a barrier? Is there a way that we can you know, put something in place next time? Um, feedback should be uh, really plain. Um, it should be able to be seen as much as you can give specific examples and information, the better. Um, you know, saying because your reaction times are slow means you're not able to drive right now. And, you know, but just be very clear and then try not to dwell on that point. So making, you know, the point, providing the feedback, and then moving on to the next thing. If they bring it up again, then you can just provide that same concrete, non-critical feedback and move on again, you know? And, you know, but if you just kind of continue that, not, you know, not getting into it, because if you dwell on the point, then that allows for them to go down the rabbit hole of like excuses and the rabbit hole of justification and all of those pieces Whereas it's much better to just provide the direct feedback and then move on as quickly before there's that opportunity. Um, self-prediction. So self-prediction is a really great treatment approach where it allows for having individuals predict their future performance on a specific task. So, um, you know, having them predict their performance and then having them complete the task and then after, see how closely they matched. Um, one way to also do this as far as self-prediction is having either a family member or a provider or somebody perform a task and you know, perform it with the errors. So you know, doing the laundry but forgetting to put in the soap or forgetting to turn it on and allowing them, the individual, to observe and give feedback. A lot of times people can recognize when somebody else is having a deficit or messing up, but they're not able to recognize that in themselves. Um, so as part of this predict self-prediction, asking these questions. So before the task, you know, how difficult will it be? Will I need to use any strategies? What strategies can I possibly use? Um, what problems might come up, and then after the task, you know, how difficult was it? How accurate was I? Um, how much help did I need? 
Uh, what could I do differently? So just kind of asking those. Um, you know, again, that procedure for assessment book has some forms that go through these. Um, they're able to be printed out and things that can be used for when working with an individual, either as a family member or as a provider to, to kind of help do some of this self-prediction. Um, teachable moments. Um, any opportunities you have for self-discovery of errors, the better. Um, back to my example of the gentleman doing the laundry, um, the mom was preventing teachable moments from happening. She was not allowing for him to be making mistakes. And as long as she kept doing it, he had no opportunity for self-discovery of his errors. So really wanting to provide as much of that teachable moment self-discovery as possible, even if it means an individual, you know, either failing or not able to complete things as well, these pieces. Um, you know, you got, you know, when I think about it, I kind of think back to the, you know, there were a lot of years that my kids didn't load the dishwasher so well, but as a result, I now have two late teens that can load a dishwasher quite well um, because there were quite a few teachable moments in what happens when you don't load it well and you would then have to wash by hand because you didn't you know, load things properly. Um, so, but you have to provide those teachable moments um, because without them, people don't, aren't able to grow. Um, as much opportunity for feedback from as many people as possible, the better. Uh, so they have more than one source of information. Um, particularly, you know, if there is anybody that's like as a provider working with somebody or a job coach or you know a counselor or family whatever your role is if it's just you saying this then you become the bad guy but if there are lots of opportunities for feedback and more people to be able to recognize it then it creates more than one source of information where it then is a piece of oh maybe there is some truth to this um, I will say as part of this, the teachable op, uh, moments and that opportunity for extra feedback. Another thing that I have utilized is in individuals doing self-report. Um, so whether that may be um, like doing some videotaping, um, that is an option, um, particularly now that just about everybody has a mechanism for filming on our phone. Um, so individual, you know, doing some filming of how an individual completes the activity so that they can then go back and monitor that. Um, or I have had individuals write themselves notes. Um, they may not be willing to follow through on something if somebody else tells them, but if it's a note or, um, something that they wrote in their handwriting, then they're like, oh, okay, I'm willing to believe that. So, so sometimes, um, particularly for individuals with memory impairments, if you can even get them engaged of what's gonna help trigger them in the future, then that can help them you know, grow and build on it. Um, goal setting. So goal setting is really difficult um, after, uh, with somebody with difficulty with awareness. Um, you know, individuals often have really large, unrealistic goals. Um, they have goals that are not in line with their deficits, but are more in line with their, their alternate view of themselves. Um, this kind of creates a discrepancy um, and really that affects participation, motivation. They are unmotivated to be engaged with treatment or any type of activity because they don't see it as related. Um, so help them um, to set smaller um, realistic goals and activities um, within their, you know, within the larger goal. So if they have a larger goal, then helping them set smaller unrealistic goals. Um, you know, and then relating the smaller goals and activities to their own personal goals. Um, you know, we're working on these memory strategies so you're able to live on your own. You want to move out of your mom's house on your own, great. But until we work on memory strategies, you're not going to be able to do that. So continually being able to relate those smaller goals back to that. 
Um, and that's true for even like completely unrealistic goal. You know, that example of the gentleman that wanted to play baseball. Um, that example comes from a friend of mine that was a provider. And, you know, one of the things that she said was she, you know, okay, well, what, you know, what are some of the things that you need to be able to play baseball? Um, you know, what is, what is the physical fitness required? Oh, okay. Well, if you want to be able to play baseball, then you're probably going to need to be able to take in an afternoon walk, you know, around two blocks. So let's work on that. Let's work on your afternoon walk. And so, you know, whether or not they want to play professional baseball, that's neither here nor there. Right now, we're just working on getting them to be taking, you know, a two block walk every afternoon. Now, as part of that two block walk, they may then start to see, oh, I am not able to meet that. But being willing to kind of set those and work with them and always relating them back to what they want to be doing for that motivation piece. Um, so acceptance. Um, this comes from uh, Carol Starr um, and her book, To Root to Rise. Um, Carol spoke at our brain injury conference two years ago in Fargo. Or no, one year ago in Bismarck. Correct? Yes. Yes. Um, so accepting brain injury is a journey of coming to terms with the new normal. It, it is not a journey of neat step-by-step -step phases. It's messy with lots of starts and stops and circling back. Um, I like that quote because that very much is the way it is. Uh, it is messy. Um, I will say, so we went through all of these awareness stages and we kind of talked about them. Now, just because somebody has reached full anticipatory awareness does not mean that they have reached full acceptance. There is the piece of the triangle of acceptance that is higher than the awareness triangle. And that's really that piece that is even once somebody has come to full awareness, they still have to really come to accept and love and get to that point of really embracing this new new person, new normal of who they are. Um, and that's that additional piece. Um, <clears throat> so now, and then as part of that, and you can see, you know, the, the emergent and the, the anticipatory have arrows connecting them to acceptance because these are stages. So when you're at anticipatory, you really are and so, at some point, having a level of acceptance and able to start, and then as part of that, able to start doing adjustments and accommodation. So you may not be fully, you know, um, I think even all of us brain injury or not, um, have not reached full acceptance of ourselves. So I don't know why we should expect individuals with brain injury to be there. Um, so it's that constant, you know, ebb and flow and go back and forth. Um, you know, and once you master one thing, you may then have something else that's kicked back. You know, this is kind of a, an ebb and flow model. It's not a, you know, set where it's at. And once you reach a stage, it's across the board and you're set there for, you know, forever. Um, again, so as part of the adjustment and accommodation piece, so back to Carol, um, it seems unlikely, but coming to acceptance can be a key that opens the door to happiness and purpose after brain injury. Um, Carol is a survivor of brain injury herself. Um, and it was, Carol really, it took her quite a bit to come to um, awareness adjustment and acceptance um, after her brain injury. But one of the things that she speaks about when she speaks on this and that, you know, I think is true for a lot of individuals with brain injury is once reaching that point of acceptance and really able to accept and then move to adjustment accommodation, it really does open those doors of happiness and then the, the next chapter. Whereas a lot of times individuals, one of the things that can be so frustrating with getting caught in this, um, getting caught in kind of that emerging growing uh, level is that that's a very frustrating place to be for individuals with brain injury. Uh, very frustrating with family working with them. That's, you know, there's a lot of anger there of what's been lost, that inability to see ever moving past it, that inability to see positive as far as like, 
accommodation and able to to move forward with things and, and so it re really is kind of a, a place of like negativity and the sooner that somebody can move to that place of acceptance it really does open that door of happiness but it is really hard for somebody that's trapped in that to be able to see that um, some final thoughts um, again, this takes time. It is a process and an ongoing one, as I said. It's not a happens overnight. It's not, you know, an immediate with a magic bullet. Um, one of the key uh, pieces is, as we just talked about, that frustration piece. Improvement and insight and awareness regarding deficits can lead to depression and adjustment difficulties. Um, you know, as somebody moves higher up in their awareness, you know, that, that bottom intellectual awareness is really, like I said, blissfully unaware. That is usually a very happy place to be. And when, when you really work with somebody on starting them to see their deficits and impairments, it's very easy to get caught in that negativity, that depression level right there in that emergent and not able to ever see a, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel of how ever going to be able to live within these deficits. How can somebody with these types of severe deficits or whatever be able to be successful? And, and so really if, if working with somebody on insight and awareness, wanting to be aware of that, um, you know, and work with them on like, you know, seeing a counselor or having family that can support them and is aware of that, um, because that can be a time where even family might say, you know, this is better for us to just let this be. He was so much better before when he, you know, he didn't even see uh, the problems. Now he sees the problems and, you know, he's horrible to live with. So as part of that, may need individual support and counseling, um, may need those components as, you know, their insight improves. So that is, that is it. So I don't know, does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any? We're just too thorough. <laughs> I, I, I guess so. <laughs> no, it was very good. Um, you're getting lots of thank yous. Thank you, helpful information. Um, so great. I'm glad that you guys enjoyed it. Um, as I said, it is one of the probably the most difficult. Uh, you know, symptomology um, after brain injury to, to manage um, and really, really frustrating. So um, I think that as much as getting a good handle on that and really starting out anytime working with somebody or family of where are they at uh, within their awareness of their deficits and how they fit in the world. Um, a great way that I always use is just a general guide is somebody that is really limited in self-awareness is somebody that nothing is ever their fault. Um, if nothing is ever their fault, then that is somebody that has some pretty limited self-awareness because, uh, you know, everybody should be able to acknowledge some areas that like they fall down in and are not so good with. But if, you know, the doc, the missing the doctor's appointment, it was because, you know, the receptionist forgot to call to, you know, tell them they were rescheduling. If they, you know, you know, those people were just talking too loud and I could, you know, if everything's always other people and not them, then that really is a big clue to me that there's some impairments in their self-awareness there. So um, I see that in the chat, Carly did say that uh, the assessments are on the Combi website. Um, she did provide that um, and these slides will be up and those are there. Um, but again, we also have all of them as PDFs. So if for some reason you forget any of that, whatever, just feel free to shoot us an email and say, hey, about those, you know, awareness assessments, whatnot, we can provide. Um, I will say the Lash and Associates is a book, so it's not free, but the other two are free. 
I, if you, we do have copies of it and the ability that we can share uh, with you guys if you, um, you know, send us an email and would like that book. So. Okay, well, thank you everybody. And as I said, in two weeks, it is Dr. Schmo. Um, and I can't remember the title for that part. Autonomic nervous system. He's gonna talk about um, how, the, how the brain injury affects your, nerve, your autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system. Um, yeah. So that is your kind of fight or flight mechanism. Right. Yeah. So which it is a lot really of your digestion and a lot of other physical things. Yeah. So yeah. all of that whole autonomic uh, nervous system pieces. So that'll be good. And then as I said, and then in a month we're doing the criminal justice one. So thank you. Take care, everybody.